Hello to niggas and niggas only. Welcome to another episode of This American Negro. But we're on YouTube, so we're going to keep it a bean up in here as well. This is your boy Marquise, Marquise Davon, This American Negro. But please don't ever call me Mark. You already know what it is. <laughs> Today is going to be a really dope episode. We are going to be in here talking to one of my good, good friends over here. Yep. You already know what it is. But before we get into that, just a quick little couple of things of house cleaning. If you want to support me, you can go to patreon.com slash Marquise Davon. That is M-A-R-Q-U-I-S-E-D-A-V-O-N. You can do as little as $2 a month, which is $24 a year. Or if you want to support me in non-monetary ways, please like, subscribe, share, engage, tell a friend to tell a friend because those are also ways to support this here podcast, this here YouTube channel. All of that is super important as we go through this process. So thank you so much for coming back. You already know this is part two of the masculinity series that I will be doing. So the first time was talking around how we don't know how to protect the soft black boy. This time we're going to be talking a little bit more around like, one, how did I get to my politic? What is, has black feminism done to me, done for me? But also how we can use black feminism as a framework to help us expand our ideas of what masculinity can look like. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to just do this in conversation with a go-to friend as well. Mm -hmm. So, y'all already see from this two shot, <laughs> he's suited all the way up. He already yeah, know what it is. Yeah, he said he's yeah, trying yeah. to outshine me on my own show. I'll fight you. No, Try no. Me. Could don't do that. Come on now. Your beard looks nice. Your hair looks nice, too. Thanks. You got a fresh cut? You got some new glasses? Don't worry about what I got. All right. That's fine. All right. Anyways, good cool. talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. if you need to know exactly how this episode is about to go down, very intentional conversation, jokes, laughs, all around it. But it'll go through a full thing around... One, what is black feminism? So we'll make sure to catch everybody up to speed. How our politics even formed, but also how does this show up in our friendship and how does this show up in our everyday life? So without further ado, let's get into this episode. So we already know we're welcome with our wonderful guest, Josh Healing Wild Black. So before we even get there, you're new to this audience. Please let them know who are you, what do you do, what is your mission. Tell them about you. Absolutely. So thank you, Bresman, for having me. My name is Josh Odom. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I am the founder and curator of Healing While Black. It is an online platform dedicated to the mental health and wellness of black, queer, trans, and non-conforming people. I am a book aficionado. I uh, don't think I have a problem, but... Don't ask my partner, but I'm I just saying, say I'm just saying, my, my business, 2300 books and counting, but nobody asked. I am very much so involved and appreciative of this conversation. And I think that one of the things we don't often uh, talk about is where does the space now, where do we navigate that space for black queer men, black trans men and black men of all experiences and how do we come to the politics that we have and how do we need to grow and what do we need to do t in order to grow that's a fact nah so i'm appreciative of you even being able to name all of that because i am a firm believer in like making space and access for like every kind of identifying person especially within our community because i think it just makes us a little bit stronger mm -hmm. but we're just gonna get into this interview we're gonna get into this conversation i want to say interview this conversation copy and in this conversation, I just want us to do like a deep dive into who we are, mm -hmm. um, but also how we got here. So yes. oftentimes people are just like, well, how, where'd you, you're like this feminist or what are you? Why are you like this big advocate? Mm -hmm. Where did this come from? And yeah. so I was thinking around like, what was your inciting incident? Like, where did your politic begin to form? Even if you didn't have a name for it yet. Yeah. I had a number of instances that, helped to shape me. I remember the moment that was really, that crystallized it for me was a friend of mine, uh, Seheya Freelon. They were talking about healthy masculinity and how, you know, that's, it's kind of a misnomer. And, or, or it's, it, it doesn't go far enough. When we talk about healthy masculinity, we're really talking about healthy personhood, right? And in that case, we understand that contemporary ideas of masculinity deprive uh, knowledge is not just men 
but masculine folks of all experiences of their humanity in regards to the full access and range of their emotions, the ability to be vulnerable, all of those things are really dehumanizing. So that was the first moment, I think it was like in 2017, if I remember correctly, that I started to really unpack and unravel what are we actually talking about when we talk about like deconstructing and divesting from patriarchy? It really does mean we're just trying to tap into our fuller humanity. Mm-hmm. No, and I love that because I think about it too. And mine even goes back to just a child. Mm-hmm. I was probably in the eighth or ninth grade. And I remember my mom came home from work and she was mad frustrated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, mom, why are you so mad? She was, She's been in her field, so she's worked in juvenile detention centers her entire life. So 17, 18 years Mm -hmm. of, like, being in this work. And they were opening up an entire new wing. And it was all boys' wing. Mm -hmm. My mom clearly had the most experience. The second person who had more experience was another black woman. And for them, they said, well, women can't run this wing. This doesn't Mm -hmm. make any sense. And so they took a man who probably had a year or two's worth of experience Mm -hmm. and basically said, well, we're going to put this person in except for instead of this other black woman that we know is like way overqualified for this thing or more than well qualified for this. Mm. So my mom had to work with another man who only had a year or two's experience where she was still coaching him, where as mm-hmm. opposed to like the two women who were well qualified. So young Marquise, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what the hell a feminist was. I was just right. like, well, that don't seem right. You got yeah. 17 years. She got 15 years. Mm hmm. Why are you two not running away? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was just like, well, they just assume like men have a different control than women do right. in terms of like how they're working with these juvenile um, kids. And so for me, I think that's as early as it started, which yeah. is like, yo, this doesn't make any sense. So yeah. we simply got paid just as much as my mom or just like a little below what she was getting paid mm-hmm. while she had put in all those years of experience and work. And right. to me, I was just like, Something here is not making sense. And yeah. so for my mom, she was just like, well, this is just how it goes. You get to be a man and be able to step in here. But I had to, like, work extra hard just to get to that space. And so for me, I remember just it didn't make sense to me. I was just like a kid is like, mm-hmm. well, this is dumb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Logically, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so I think that's as early as when I'm realizing yeah. a feminist politic even existed before I can name it. Right. And so, one, thanks for sharing the story. But, mm-hmm. like. Now, as you kind of grazed in, into that a little bit more, what was it like to like unlearn? Because I think so much of us, we always show up in these social media spaces, in our platforms, and it's just like, all right, well, we know we're going to de- 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 wow, words, dismantle I mean, white supremacy, patriarchal you- capitalism. Mm-hmm. Boom. And so even as we're going through that, I'm just like, yo. Mm-hmm. Somebody was just like, well, how'd you get here? What was like your process? Like, when did you decide what kind of man you wanted to be? And that's a question we got from um, a viewer from last week, Hmm. which is like, when did you decide what kind of man you wanted to be? And so as you learned about this politic, what did you have to unlearn? I'll start there. Yeah, um, a lot. Uh, (laughs) for, uh, For a short answer, but the... I'd say the biggest thing that I had unlearned, and I'm still unlearning, right, because this is a process. It's Mm -hmm. never a destination. It was this idea of being interdependent with a community that actually wants to show up for you Mm -hmm. and that will if you allow them. Um, That was the biggest thing that I had to learn. unlearn was that people will actually – show up for you and hold you and care for you if you let them. And I remember you were talking about that and how did how do a lot of black boys that grow into black men get to that place where there is no space for them to even entertain the idea of somebody else holding them is because, well, maybe that kid was shut down or dismissed or ridiculed or bullied in childhood to where this is now the the logical outcome, or why would I ever allow somebody in in, um, in a vulnerable place, allow them to see me in a vulnerable space, when in actuality this is what I have as evidence to say this is in a safe place, safe thing to do. And so that was a really big thing that I had to unlearn was that, yeah, not everybody deserves your vulnerability, and the people who have shown themselves to be trustworthy mm-hmm. and safe want to be in community with you, want yeah. to hold you if you let them. That's smooth. 
And I, I like that you named that because that's something I still struggle with mm-hmm. to this day, right? Like, I grew up with such a loving community, especially, like, around my friends. Like, I've yeah. had the same friends for the last 16, 17 years at mm-hmm. this point. And so, for me, it's always been super dope to just, like, talk with them because those are the first people I was able to cry in front of. Those mm-hmm. are the first people I was able to, like, be vulnerable with. Mm-hmm. But even then, and it's funny because I feel like it, as I got older, it was when I started kind of, like, giving one version of myself yeah. and not letting people in to like see all of the other sides of me. So it, mm-hmm. I think that for me was one of big, was a huge learning lesson um, an unlearning process mm-hmm. <laughs> that I had, that I'm going through now of just like, what does it look like for them to be able to see who I am flaws and all mm-hmm. and not have like this perf- picture perfect image. Like mm-hmm. I created an image that just everybody felt like they were my best friend. I was definitely not their best friend. Yeah. <laughs> and so I yeah. said, even in that, I was like around people, but still isolated. Right, and it's just something I think I just internalized because growing up, especially with a single parent, I mentioned this a little bit, but like my mom had to like give us her idea of what masculinity was, hmm. and so it definitely leaned a little bit more toxic. I love you now, mom, but like, girl, you was toxic. But <laughs> <laughs> but it got into this whole conversation for me, and it's like an internal dialogue of my ideas of what it was to be a man was to make sure I got to college, mm-hmm. graduate from college, get a job with benefits and just kind of go through and just like, I just hit different markers. Right. And then also I've been working since I've been 16. Like yeah. I wanted to always provide for myself. So I didn't even let the space of other people to provide for me. So the idea of like allowing community to like help you out mm-hmm. is very different. And so when I started getting into like black feminism a lot more and just like learning around bell hooks and um, even Alex Holmes, who is on here now who deconstructs masculinity and kind of talks around the mental wellness of men. Mm -hmm. I had to just like check in with myself and be like, yo, what does community actually look like for me? What is it outside of just like time? What is it when you just put intention behind it Mm -hmm. and not just say we've been friends for 16 years? Yeah. What was that intention behind it? And so for me, I think that's what, I was unlearning of like, I don't have to do this by myself and providing doesn't have to look one way and it's just not monetarily. Right. So those are like big learning lessons for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And even just missteps too. Like there were times I said, no, I had a lot of women that were really close to me and I sat there and I said, oh, I got to learn some stuff. Yeah, listen, they gathered the fuck out of me. Yeah. And so- Appreciate y'all. You said, okay. Thank you. We appreciate y'all. Um. But now even moving into it, too, like, we talked around, like, the inciting incident of, like, where did our politics start to form? Some of the stuff that we had to unlearn. Mm -hmm. But what was your, who was the person that you were guided towards in terms of, like, reconstructing what your masculinity even looked like? Yeah. Um, So I had, I, I consider myself very fortunate in that I had a number of, men around me who provided models Mm -hmm. that it didn't have to look like this rigid archetype of masculinity. Mm -hmm. There was my dad. um, There was my mentor, Tyson. um, There was my cousin. All of these different people showed me that I, I can literally move through my masculinity in ways that feel good to me that are aligned with where I am and what I am and what I want to do and want to be, uh, which is queer, nerdy, right? I like to dress nice, right? All of these things that are seen as like deviating from the norm, they provided models to say like, no, like, you know, my masculinity has never been questioned and I am attuned, I have emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. I have emotional awareness, I have boundaries. I know when to let folks in and I know when to uh, maybe keep those um, relationships a little bit more surface level because they're not safe people to uh, go there with. Well, can I, yeah. what, is, what does that look like, like in everyday practice for you? Yeah. So for one, it really does, again, I think this goes back to the point that you were raising about your mom, realizing that I'm not I'm not the smartest person in the room and if so then I need to find a different room to be in and this idea of men have to be in charge and dominant and domineering that is really important to 
to know and understand that leadership doesn't have to look like somebody standing over you and dictating. Leadership can look soft, so to speak, right? For lack mm-hmm. of a better word, leadership can look like listening. Leadership can look like asking somebody. And I, I, one of the things I really have um, taken up as a practice when somebody is sharing what they're going through, they may be talking about their the problem at work. They may be talking about something going on in the relationship. One thing I say is, well, how would you like me to respond? Or what kind of feedback would be necessary? Or how can I best support you? Do you mm-hmm. want me to give you feedback or do you want me to just listen, right? Because I understood the role of a quote unquote man was to provide solutions. And again, my homies, some of my homegirls saying like, yo, I don't need you to try to solve things right now. Mm -hmm. I just need you to listen to me and be a a safe place so I can just vent. And maybe we'll come up with some solutions later. And that was a really big unlearning moment for me of like, okay, just be here, right? Be present. This person Mm -hmm. is trusting you enough to share their Vulnerable, vul- their vulnerabilities. Excuse me. You know, words have been tripping today. It's okay. it really have. It's Monday. <laughs> you know, but you don't have to try to figure out something right now. Nobody's asking you to fix this. Just be. There's right. time for that later. Right now, just be and be present. And were there other men that allowed you to just do that, or was that first space from a woman? I, in looking back on it, that first space was my grandma. Mm-hmm. Um, and also my grandfather, so my grandparents, mm-hmm. um, they were the first people, and my great aunt Edna, they were the first Edna. people, <laughs> yes, Lord, you know, <laughs> Alabama, you know, they were the first people that just allowed me to just be and voice my frustrations, mm-hmm. my insecurities, and they didn't force me to come up with a solution just yet. They said, okay, just feel what you need to feel, Yeah, right? Do what you got to do. We'll come up with a solution, but... Right now, just be here, and then we'll figure out everything on the back end later. What was it like when you had that option? Because that's something I think around a lot is, like, for your grandparents to be able to provide a space like that yeah. is also interesting because, you, you, you know, you get away with some stuff with your grandparents. But, but <laughs> yes. to even be soft, right. right? How did the men around you respond to that? How did you have to reckon with, like, oh, wow. Or was it always like there, like you were allowed to just always like process and not have to have a solution? In certain cases, yes. In other cases, no. So I I preface that by saying there, you know, some men in my family, I love them with all my heart. You know, they were not the people who you came to when you just wanted to vent. They were mm-hmm. like, well, they never, they were never responded, you know, violently, be it emotional, physical or otherwise. But it was very much so like, hey, if you're going to complain, you need to figure out what to do, right? Don't come to me with your problem unless you have something to provide as a solution. And I didn't have it at the time. And looking back on it, it was really to the to the point, it was really freeing to just say, like, yo, I don't know, I'm unhappy, I'm scared, I'm frustrated, and I don't know what to do right now, and I just need a moment, mm-hmm. right? And we don't often provide that space for black children to just say, like, hey, like, I, I don't know how to figure this out right now. I'm just frustrated. I'm feeling my feelings. Maybe I can't even identify what those feelings are just yet. Mm-hmm. But maybe solutions are not the thing I need right now. Right. Yeah, I think that that was something hard for me as well. It was just like I felt like I was always like perpetually in like solution mode. Mm-hmm. So like, mm-hmm. it might be until this year where I was just like, I don't have an answer. Yeah. <laughs> and openly admitting that and being like okay with it. And it's like nerve wracking because you're, as I know, not only say you're, but like for me, it was always a solution. It's like, all right, cool. You got to do this. This is what the next move will be because I don't have time to make mistakes and I didn't have the space to be able to make mistakes like that. So for yeah. me, it's always been, I need to know at least three different solutions before I even make a decision. Right. Right. And so that's something even for me. So I appreciate you sharing that because it was sitting with my pop pop when we used to go fishing on the mm-hmm. Delaware mm-hmm. and just sitting there and just listening to him talk around like, all of his fuck ups. And I said, mm-hmm. Papa Leroy, you're like this deity in my mind. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you're so peaceful. <laughs> like, yeah. So I remember sitting there on the Delaware and we were just sitting there in quiet and he just started talking. And I was just like, this man is wise. This man is just like yeah. processing emotions, but I've never seen it happen 
with people my age like that. Yeah. So in my mind, I said, damn, I'm not reaching enlightenment till like I'm 65. <laughs> 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 Tragic. Um, but yeah, and I would just remember him like, especially as he was getting close to his end of his life of just like, yeah. make sure you make time for family and make sure that you still tell jokes. Because even on his way out, he was... He, he said, right, big head, I'm gonna Yeah, it was. He told my mom, Big head, I'm gonna haunt you in an afterlife. <laughs> yeah. Let you know ah. right now. <laughs> and he had like a real if you need to know where my laugh came from, it came from my papa. <laughs> ah. Sitting there watching westerns as he went out. Fuck. <laughs> I don't wanna go out no other way. Yeah. So but I think it was important to have those moments in time because he taught me to like be patient. Um and my circumstances didn't allow me to always put that into practice. But yeah. this year, he's been with me a lot more yeah. in terms of that practice. And so that's been really dope. But I'm even thinking around even my everyday practices, too. right? Yeah. And so they're always just like, well, why do you show up like this? What? How did you learn to just be mindful and like create space and whatnot? Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because where I see myself showing up the most is like in a professional space. Hmm. And the professional space, it's always thinking around. You know, I, I don't like, I don't like being told what to do hmm. at all. <laughs> but um, all of my bosses have only ever been black women or black non-binary folks, hmm. and so I've only had one male boss, mm -hmm. and the rest were all black women. And then getting into my new position, um, it's been a black man, well, just black people mm -hmm. in general. And for me, I realized the one time where I was going through college, got out of college, and my first boss, I had to like go through like these mental gymnastics. Because as I'm learning around, like how do I take up space as a man? Every decision I make, I go through this process of just like, am I reacting this way because they think I'm young? Am I reacting this way because they're a woman? Am I reacting this way because they're dark skinned? Am I reacting this way because they try to sun me? Am I? Mm -hmm. So I go like through, through this entire process of just like. Before I respond, I have to make sure I have to check my biases. I have to check my own ego, and then I have to like engage in a conversation, mm -hmm. um, just to make sure like I'm not being sexist in the workplace and yeah. I'm not <laughs> causing harm mm -hmm. um, to non men in the workplace, even if it's just through like a sly comment and stuff like that. I gotta right. be mindful around like yeah. what I'm doing. I'm not saying it's ever perfect because sometimes it nah. comes in my head and comes right out. Yeah, <laughs> it happens, and. I just remember like going through that process for the first time when I first graduated and was working at this arts nonprofit and was just mm -hmm. like, all right, no, this lady's just trash. Yeah. <laughs> I had to get there. Yeah. And so it was like interesting because even in the space of wanting to be well-intentioned, I also found myself continuously even making excuses yeah. for like my boss who was a woman. And I was just like, Nah, you're just you're actually causing harm. Like, yeah, <laughs> never had anxiety attack before, but I had anxiety attack working under her, and yeah. that was crazy. Yeah. So yeah, I think even as we get to that, and I'm thinking around our unlearning process and figuring mm -hmm. out like what does this look like every day, and how does it show up in different spaces, whether it's home, family, professional. Yeah. I think the next part I really want to like dive into now is, you know, we can get a little intellectual with it. Let's Please. talk around the patriarchy. Let's talk around. <laughs> your mm -hmm. platform in particular because I think you do a really intentional job around one, making space, but two, being able to call a spade a spade yeah, and being able to like call men in. Right. So talk to me around like even your approach to if you had to pitch black feminism as a way to expand your masculinity, what would your pitch be? You can take some time to think about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is actually a real conversation that I've been having with myself a lot in the wake of Lance Reddick just passed away. Mm -hmm. um, Dave from De La Soul just passed away. Like losing a lot of young, losing a lot of, a lot of brothers like very early on. And I, I look at that when you couple that with the idea, we, we couple that with the fact that like, just a lot of men are unhappy. Mm -hmm. They are friendless. They are going through a lot in regards to their own mental wellness. I see that as 
a combination, a number of factors, um, be it genetic, societal. And I, we do need to have a conversation about how our understandings of how to show up in the world, how to show up in the West, in the United States as a black man is harmful to the, se- to, to the self first and foremost, but also harmful to other people around you. And I say all that because when we talk about, you know, I don't call myself a feminist. I don't do that. I subscribe to black feminism as an ideal. I'm critical of my masculinity. I don't self-identify as such, but I realize I that this is it under abolitionist. That's how yeah, I kind of go. Yeah, around. You I know, feel like it's just like an umbrella for like, yeah, you yeah. know, I, I say all that because it has allowed me space to move. It has allowed me space to breathe. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in a kind of hyperbolic or, or, or cliche way. If I was still subscribing to these, ideals and tenets that I, I had when I was 16 years old, I'd be dead right now. Mm-hmm. And I mean that in a very literal way. Um, because my mental health was suffering in a very acute way. And it took me moving away from this idea of acknowledging mental illness is somehow unmasculine or unwell. And healing in community is somehow a cop out, right? We don't, I I personally do not believe in healing in isolation, Mm -hmm. right? We heal in community. And um, going back to the intellectual piece, when I first read Sisters of the Yam, it, uh, Bell Hook, uh, Bell Hook spoke about what does that then do for black men when there is not a collective space of healing Mm -hmm. and how that is to the detriment of all of our health and what does that do for us and what does it do for the sphere of influence that we have around us, be it partners, <coughs> parents, siblings, close friends, if right. you can even call them friends, right? The people that you hang around with. So if I'm pushing black feminism to that, to an, another brother, it's like, if you want some more space to just, just be outside of these tenants that say you are unmanly because you do this or you don't do that, you should consider this. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah, because I think that's part of like the ideals of black feminism. It requires us to be in community. It requires harm reduction. It requires mindfulness. Mm-hmm. And pitching that can be difficult sometimes because you're just like, oh, I want to do this feminine shit. What the f- is this? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as I like even got into that journey too, which I love you talked around, like the community healing has to happen in community, mm-hmm. but community requires trust yeah. because you need to know how to navigate shame. You have to navigate um, vulnerability. You have to navigate what does community look like to you? Yeah. Because in reality, like I'm not in community with everybody and yeah. the people who genuinely are looking for me to be able to have that transformation, to be able to have that change, that is taking time to get, get to know you because people don't change from me shouting like you suck you suck you suck yeah that's because they don't care there's nothing for them to feel guilty about Mm -hmm. but like if i talk to you yeah who i talk to regularly that's a different kind of situation but like Mm -hmm. if we're all working from this non-uniformed idea Mm -hmm. (laughs) of like what masculinity can look like right i don't know if like we have tenets of like what is acceptable masculinity what is healthy masculinity because we see toxic we see hyper we just see masculinity but mm-hmm. we never see like what does it mean to just be right and masculinity existing without the extremes right right and i think that's where we go back to the point around that's when i first brought up say as common is like i'm just trying to be a healthy person right mm-hmm. above all else like and realizing that these these tropes these ideals as to what i should be were making me very sick. Yeah. And and I, again, I don't mean this in a cliche way, you know, my physical and mental health were suffering. Yeah. And even when you talk about well what are our extre- what are our 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 examples of hypermasculinity and, and and what happens when we look to these models of masculinity as the models because I'm sure you've talked to your students about Andrew Tate 
in the like in the manosphere. I'm so scared that they're all fans of Andrew Tate. And they, if they are. ask about a Bugatti again. I'm gonna let them know. You know what I mean? Y'all do not own Bugattis. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> that so means what? he doesn't think that your sh- your value, you have any value, or your opinion has value, right? Mm-hmm. So, so what what does that say, right? What right. does that say? And what did, again? What are these younger boys learning? As to what my what am I what is my value outside of what I can produce mm-hmm. and what I can take? Yeah, and that's something that always like worried me because I'm like the manosphere, like the Andrew Tates and the Kevin Samuels of the world, they reinforce the exact same things a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Like one, they know the emotion to tap into is the anger of right. the black man. Like right. we 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 are angry people, and not angry in a way of just like I just want to fuck everything up. But it's angry in a way of just like, yo, I've been hurt and nobody's like listening. So mm-hmm. to have a space where somebody's like, man first, man first, it's something that's tempting to look at. Yeah. But I am also convinced that like what a lot of us are looking for is guidance and somebody mm-hmm. to like go to to have like these intentional conversations mm-hmm. too, right? Which is why I love the FD signifiers. I like the mm-hmm. Alex Holmes the Healing White Black platform. It's my own platform mm-hmm. because I do think that they serve as counter spaces to a like a very severe like toxicity that was putting out there Mm -hmm. um but it is i think the other part is when i talk around this guidance that people are looking for it is something of like who am i outside of money sexual domination and power Mm. and that's what black men are told like we have to be in terms of like even a provider like if we cannot provide those three things or at least two of those three things we're entirely like messed up Mm -hmm. and so even for that i think the black feminine a case for black feminism is going to look at what are the things that are not working for us and if we even take the masculine ideal it's now understanding that we don't have to be stoic all the time Mm -hmm. our healing does not have to happen in isolation we don't have to be brave all the time we don't have to do any of this stuff all the time and so being able to understand one what is my full humanity and what does it look like to get there? Because that process is scary. Yeah. Because we then have to admit like our shame around being harmed or being a victim. Yeah. And I think that's that stuff is hard. Like yeah. I had a breakthrough the other <laughs> what was that a month ago? Mm-hmm. I'm saying I said, dang, I cannot control my tears right now. Yeah. Right. And that's that's scary, right? You know, I, <laughs> I had I had um I had a friend of mine talk about his process, and he's a gym dude like mm-hmm. he just that's what he that's what he does yeah. and he also subscribes to a lot of the things that we subscribe to in regards to ideals around personhood and masculinity and he said like bro it is much easier to like deadlift three place than it is to fix a character flaw Man, talk about it. you know what i mean like i I, it, I like to just indulge myself in working too much so i don't have to worry about my problems right <laughs> you know what i mean and it's like let me produce you know what I mean? Let me let me do something. And like the idea, like I have to, going back to this masculine idea, like something has to be done at all times. I have to do something. I have to produce something, or else, what am I doing? As if the idea of being, sitting, reflecting, contemplating, assessing, those are not things that have value in a capitalist society. Mm-hmm. And I and and it's funny because these are things that are spoken about at. In in serious detail, we read bell hooks and we read the Kambahi River Collective, right? And the funny thing is, like, niggas in the manosphere are getting advice about black phys- about black feminism from other niggas in the manosphere, and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about, right? And in fact, words yo, matter. you know, words <laughs> matter. They sh- they just matter, right? And, and and that's why, like, I you can all you can know right away who has engaged in the material and who hasn't because. Let's be real, like Bell Hooks sometimes gave Bell Hooks gave black men sometimes more grace than we deserve in a lot of ways. There the Kabahi River Collective clearly stated that we don't believe that men are violent because of some biological nature. We've been socialized that way. So there needs to be a societal upheaval if we want black men to heal. That's not something that's being spoken about because they didn't read the shit. Mm-hmm. And if we're actually having conversations, we gotta actually talk about brothers around how are you how are you engaging with this material are you just listening to talking points from other niggas or are you sitting with this for yourself and even struggling through it do we have spaces by which we can then struggle through this together 
So thank you for naming that because it's a struggle part together, right? right. Now, it depends on the day because sometimes I do not have the patience to be teaching all the time. I'll be over it. For free at least. But <laughs> what does it look like to like fully be in community with the people who want to get the work done, yeah. right? And knowing and having grace enough to know like, yo, just be patient as mm-hmm. I go through this because it's going to take time. Because yeah. I think about my own process and – I didn't come out the womb like believing in the black feminist ideal. Right. <laughs> I didn't, right? Mm-hmm. But I do think that it took me probably started thinking around this 11th or 12th grade whenever I read Their Eyes Were Watching God mm-hmm. and then I read Go Tell It on a Mountain by James Baldwin and then when I got into theater and violence in college mm. is when all of it started to kind of make a little bit more sense to mm-hmm, me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and wanted to like actively like work through that. And so to see where I've arrived by 27, that process and even as to get where I'm at right now took 10 years. Yeah. And so it is like now that conversation around it took me this long to like just feel like I've arrived and like feel like I'm somewhat decent in my humanity, mm-hmm. and not saying I'm going out my way to like you know be a dick, but right. like just being mindful of who I am today and taking time to journal, taking time to sit down and read, understanding what I need to recharge, understanding how I show up according to other people, like and that's something like even me showing up is something I'm realizing like mm, Marquise, you did some shit, yeah. right? Yeah, and so. What is your process like when you get into that? Because I know I had to sit there and think around what are my non-negotiables in terms of like certain men that I want to be around. And like for me growing up in an abusive household, like abusive men are like my trigger. Yeah. I will not be able to like deal with that. So I think it's another man's job to like get it, kind of get in there. Yeah. I can still be mindful around like, all right, well, did this thing happen? What could the context be? Mm-hmm. Did something happen that it, did he react? To all of that, mm-hmm. but there is something that like I know I still have to actively process before I'm around that kind of man. But yeah. I can handle somebody who might be a little sexist or misogynist. I can handle those yeah. people around like the comments because mm-hmm. we can learn. Because I don't think people are inherently bad, mm-hmm. but we just needed some redirection and guidance at times. So like, yeah. what would be your non-negotiable, and then what would your process of dealing with? manosphere or just toxic or hyper masculine men well yeah. even before the non-negotiable i think what you described is a capacity or excuse me i heard capacity and then i heard will like you had the will and the want and the desire to do better mm-hmm. right and a lot of people just don't and I, I don't think that that's that's inherently i don't think it's fucked up to say that like some people have the will to want more, do more, to grow. And some folks are not at that place. And balancing that of like, I don't have the time or energy to drag niggas. I don't have the time or energy or the capacity to pour into a lid that is clearly shut. I think that's a waste of my resources. And holding these conflicting thoughts in in tandem with each other it is my not my non-negotiable really is if you clearly don't want this, then I'm not gonna sit here and try to force it on you. Now when you can come back when you're ready, right? But there have been many times where I wasn't ready. There have probably been many times where you weren't ready. And you can only meet somebody where they're where they're at and when they're ready to receive this. So in order to do what I need to do and have peace of mind and have quality of life. I've had to make that boundary of I am here when you want to have a conversation about it. I am here when you want to sit through this and struggle with an open mind. And we can, you know, we're going to wrestle, we're going to tussle, we're going to have moments where we just disagree, right? You're going to fight, right? (laughs) And I'm not going to sit here and argue with you on minutia, right? I'm not going to sit here and argue with you about you know, what about this percentage of single black uh, women with college degrees? And what about this? And what about that? Because all of that is just, again, that's, we majoring in the minors now. That's not what I want to do. And if 
we can have that space where we can recognize, yo, you are here right now. And I hope somebody loves you enough and cares about you enough to explain to you why you're wrong. But that by no means has to be me. If we can center it there, then I think we can all figure out like where we plug in in this larger struggle, if you will. But I'm not going to drag anymore because I realized I was spending time angry and these niggas was going out doing what they're going to do. And I'm the one who's still, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. No, and I appreciate that answer because I think that's also part of the process. I think we're being able to name an ideal, but that ideal without practice is definitely, Mm -hmm. it's a great idea. Yeah. But we are also dealing like with harm reduction. We're dealing with, and that's not even just harm to other people, like harm to self, because we know black men are killing ourselves at the highest rates right now, too, mm-hmm. right? So I'm even thinking around like the way that we're even continuously suffering, and it's a slow, slow drip of suffering. Yeah. But also to the other point of like black feminism is definitely a good framework to start with. Mm hmm. And to build off of in a way that makes sense for where you're at, because I think it can apply in so many different ways and so many different situations. And like with the ideal of what black feminism can be, but then the reality of like we're talking around human emotions and humans are all fickle. Like I can say I'm emotionally intelligent, but I don't think I'm always emotionally mature <laughs> to like handle people. Right. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, I be having to drag myself. I said, yeah. no, nah, I know this is wrong, but I'm still react this way because I'm going to react how I feel like reacting. But, but I, think I know the what thing, should though. happen. But I think that's the thing though. I think that's why like there's always this idea of like moral superiority that comes from people who are trying to usually coming, coming from, people on the left the idea like i have like the moral high ground in this moment when that's not the case right i'm not saying i'm not saying i don't i don't mess this up right yeah i'm saying i have at least enough self-awareness to say okay i wasn't i was not operating in accordance with my ideals at this moment in time how do i do better how do i so what do you do when you fuck up acknowledge okay first and foremost right the impact always goes over the intent yeah and then make the acknowledgement of wow, this is not my best moment, or this is not me. This is not me and my best self, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to let shame win. Oh, so yeah, I'm like not that. going to let shame win and say that this is going to take me into a spiral. We're all fallible, right? We all have moments where we are not operating in accordance with our beliefs, and there's opportunities to do better. Right. There's opportunities to repair. There's opportunities to grow. That is on me because I would hope that we all want to do better. But again, hope isn't a strategy. Right. So the folks who I know I surround myself with, I know that they have a desire to challenge themselves, challenge me, hold me accountable, and vice versa, and then we can grow in that regard. Right. So that's when I say, like, I know I want to fuck up, right? I'm subscribing to black feminism, so being emotionally intelligent, being emotionally aware doesn't mean you're never going to fuck up. That oh, we would be both we both would be lying if we said that to anybody. Man, wow, hypocrites. That's crazy. You know what I mean? And it's also the idea of okay, well, when when you fuck up, right? Here is a bit of a blueprint to not go down this shame spiral, right? And not indict your masculinity or not think that you are somehow undeserving of care, of love, and of support. All the things that patriarchy teaches you that. Oh well, when you fuck up, or if you don't have X, Y, or Z, then you are undeserving of all of these different things. That was so nice. Like it was really a word. <laughs> uh, my words start working toward the end of the you podcast. Like, okay, you said, <laughs> ah! like, what is white supremacy? Patriarch? What was those words? No, but I really appreciate that point, and especially like just to sit with that point by the end of this episode too, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think the biggest thing that we have to navigate is like shame yeah and like resilience against that shame and like what do i do when i do have this mess up what does it look like for me to recover what does it look like for me to acknowledge like that's the part of my work that i know i'm still like working on yeah. right is like i don't like making mistakes yeah. i don't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so when i do i when i tell you any mistake breaks me out into like a cold sweat i'm just like fuck what all right so I go into my head. So even before being able to address that person, I'm just like, mm. all right, this is what I said. This is what I feel. This is how I interpreted it. This is what I did. Let me know. All right. Did I say this the wrong way? Was this tough? Like, I'm always thinking around, like, that stuff. And mm-hmm. it 
trying to sometimes just stays there. <laughs> so it never like talks around. Yeah. I never get to the yeah, I messed up part, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the part that for me I know is like the shame around hurting somebody but knowing like that's inevitable. Yeah. But it's a matter of like how do you rebound from that harm? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. so I appreciate that because I think that's something like even the viewers can sit with, and especially like black men sitting with that of just knowing like failure is not futile and like when you receive feedback that shit's norm it should be yeah. in love it's not out of like you suck and you're gonna stay you're gonna always suck mm-hmm. right so i i appreciate that point to end on for the audience and so before we get out of here and before i wrap up this episode josh one more time first and foremost thank you for being here thank I you appreciate for the hell out of you um but also let the know let the people know where can they find you and what are you about one more time? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. Um, sorry. See, you got jokes, huh? <laughs> I'm trying to do my outro. You trying to do this? Really? Can I do my outro? What? Can I do my outro? All right, go. Dang. So you can find me at Healing While Black on Instagram. Um, Healing While Black on Twitter with the black is spelled B-L-K. And you can look me up at my website, on my website, at www.healingwhileblack.me like me, myself, and I. Me, myself. I know what you I knew I was coming there. You know um, no, but for real, for real, for those who are watching, please, in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts are around this. Um, anybody who's felt like you got something out of this conversation, please let me know in the comments. Make sure to share with a friend, tell a friend to tell a friend because all of that matters. And once again, thank you for keeping it a bean on this American Negro, having this conversation with this wonderful Negro right here, gang, gang. I look forward to the third part of this episode. Um, The third part is going to be an installment talking about black fatherhood and what does it look like to raise a young boy in today's day and age as well. So I'm so looking forward to that next conversation to be had. Josh, thank you for being here. Everybody else, for those who are viewing, thank you for coming back. I hope to see you again. Peace.